a, taking a diversion from Acts, uh, doing a, um, a New Year's message. Perhaps not the most typical place or book to go to, thinking about the New Year, but you'll, I think you understand what we're going on about as we go through it. Jaden, would you like to read for us our text for today? Yes. This is Lamentations chapter 3, verses 1 to 26. This I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning, great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait eagerly. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this text. And Lord, again, Lord, we just pray, uh, Lord, that you really minister to us this morning, Lord. Just please be speaking through Dan, Lord, and just meet each of us where we are, Lord, and as a church, Lord, that please transform us today. And just thank you for this opportunity to sit under your word, Lord. Um, yeah, we just thank you that we can just have such a hope in you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Jaden. I want you, and me for that matter of fact, to enter into 2019 with hope. We're only a couple of days away, a couple of days to go till we enter another year, and there is something nice about having a, a period of New Year, because it forces you to look back and reflect on what has been, but then also to look forward to what could potentially take place in the New Year. And as I say, I want you and myself to enter with hope. Uh, not because you know exactly what's going to happen, because none of us do. No matter how planned we are, we really do not know everything that's going to take place. And not because you have all of the skills necessary to navigate life without any problems. Not because it's going to be a struggle-free year, but I want you to go into this new year with hope because God is faithful. And I'm taking you to the book of Lamentations to explore that fact. Written during a dark time in Israel's history where yet again they have turned their back on God and as a result were handed over to their enemies. Jerusalem, the great city, lies in ruins but from the rubble we hear the cry, great is your faithfulness. Uh, it says this in like an intro to the lamentations in my Bible. It says this, in the face of death and destruction, with life seemingly coming apart, the author, which is generally attributed to Jeremiah, the author turns tragedy into a triumph of faith. God has never failed him in the past. God has promised to remain faithful in the future. And in light of the God he knows and loves, Jeremiah finds hope and comfort. If you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have every reason to enter this new year with hope. And that is what we're going to be looking at today. And what we read in Lamentations 3.21 says this, this I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. Choose to meditate on that which brings about hope. Here the author is saying that there is something which when he chooses to think about it, when he chooses to recall it, to call it to mind, it ends up giving him hope. What is it that you choose to call to mind? What takes up the majority of your thoughts and your thinking? Is it God and the truths about him or is it something else? If your, if your thinking is consumed, for example, by your inability or consumed by the circumstances themselves, 
it will become easier to lose hope. And I think this is in part why the Apostle Paul gives such practical advice in Philippians, where he says this in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8 to 9, where he says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. True, noble, just, pure, lovely, of good report, virtuous, praiseworthy. Does this not perfectly describe Jesus? Choose to meditate on him. And I must confess how little of my thought life is dedicated to him. And as a result, I miss out on so much. And one of those things is peace. When I meditate on Jesus and the things of him and then seek to live those things out, God will be with me and I will experience his peace. Back to our text in Lamentations, I don't think this is just an intellectual exercise which is happening here for the author, but I believe it goes much deeper. This recalling to mind, it it starts with our minds, our thinking, but eventually it has to make its way to our hearts. And the word that the author uses for mind is lab, which can be translated as the heart, but likewise, the center of everything. I don't think the author is just saying he's just intellectually thinking about these things, although I think that is where he is starting, but rather it is then beginning to take those truths and bring them to his very heart, to the very core of who he is. Don't just bring this truth to your mind, but bring it to your heart, to the center of who you are. And the fact that he uses the term recall to turn, to return, shows us that this is a truth that he's known previously and has forgotten or turned away from. Have you forgotten to meditate on the truth that you once knew, that God is faithful? Have you turned your back on it? Circumstances around you have become too painful to bear, so you turned your back on the idea that God is faithful, and as a result, you find yourself in a place of hopelessness. If that's you, then recall these truths to mind. Just as Jeremiah does, and experience the hope that fills his heart. And these are the truths that he brings to mind. Verse 22 of Lamentations 3. Through the Lord's mercy, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. We have hope when we call to mind the fact that because of God's mercy, we are not consumed. Because of God's mercy, we are not consumed. In Israel's case, despite generation after generation of constantly turning their back on God, he still refused to completely forsake them. Yes, he he would allow them to go through seasons of discipline, but even the intention of those moments was to bring his people back to him. It was to lead them back home. Even even in his disciplining of them, he is not forsaking them. To the point that from among them he would raise up a saviour so that not only Israel but us as well, all of us could experience the mercy of God. You may have heard the saying once before, justice is getting what you deserve Mercy is not getting what you deserve. 
And grace is getting what you don't deserve. You see, we deserve to be consumed. Because of our sin, we deserve to be cut off from God, both now, but then also for all eternity. But for those who put their faith in Jesus, we receive mercy. We do not receive the judgment that we deserve because Jesus chose to take our place. Dying on the cross, the death that we deserve to die. And this is the gospel. This is the good news. And when we recall it to mind, it gives us hope. Choose to meditate on the gospel because that is what brings us hope. But what you may be thinking, and many other people have thought the same thing, is this, how could God show mercy to me? My sin is too great. You don't know what I've done. And if you've wrestled with that question, you're not the only one. Many people have wrestled with that question. And I was reading a book recently where a pastor explains his experience responding to someone who also had that same mindset. It says this, in the book. I met with a young man many times to help him believe and receive God's gracious forgiveness through faith in Jesus. At one time he told me he had committed so many heinous sins that he didn't believe God could forgive him. And the pastor says this, I kept affirming that God's power is greater than his sin, that his grace is sufficient. So one day he told me many of the things he had done and he was right. They were horrible. So, do you think God can forgive all that? He asked. Yes, of course I do, the pastor replied. He said this, I'm certain. Your pride led you to sin and that same pride is leading you to believe your sin is more powerful than God's grace forgiveness and power your sin can't defeat God's grace brother he is greater than you and his grace is greater than your sin what true and amazing words from this man you see God's grace is bigger than your sin and that truth alone should give us hope as we enter this new year. God's grace is bigger than your sin, your past sin, your present sin, and your future sin. His grace is bigger. And as the author declares in Lamentations, his compassion never fails. His compassion fails not. Because of his tender love, God issues mercy. He shows compassion that will never fail. I love the way that the, the ESV translates this verse where it translates it this way. It says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. The idea of steadfast love is a love that keeps on going. A love that keeps on pursuing, a love that keeps on fighting. It is a faithful love and that is the kind of love that God has for you and he has for me. And the mercy he displays, it doesn't come to an end. And the next verse reinforces this truth. Lamentations 3.23, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Each day when you wake up, there are new mercies. God's mercy towards me and towards you is not just a one-time event. It is a daily, consistent and a persistent reality. The mercy I experience today doesn't have a limit. 
I can't exhaust it. But on top of that, there are new mercies for me to experience just around the corner. This means a number of different things. Firstly, I don't need to wait until the next day to experience his mercy. Sometimes we do that, right? Sometimes like, oh man, I've messed up today. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna give up for the rest of the day and go to sleep, and then when I wake up, then I'll start again. But God's mercy is big enough to meet you right there. You don't need to wait till the next day. If I've messed up, I can run to him right then. But not only that, how much hope this should give us as we wake up. As sure as the sun rises, so does God's mercy. I don't think many of us go to sleep, right, worrying about if the sun is going to rise tomorrow, right? I don't think anybody ever has, or, well, yeah, I certainly have. I don't think I ever remember a time going to bed and being like, man, I hope the sun comes up tomorrow. We don't doubt it. It's, it's a surety. We know it's going to rise. But even more sure than that is the mercy of God. And we should be just as sure about the new mercy which is on offer to us from God each day. When you see that sunrise, remember that with it comes more and more mercy from God. As you see that sunrise, remember that new mercy is available to you that day. Mercy that empowers you to say no to sin and temptation. Mercy and compassion that forgives you when you do fall. Mercy to change and mercy to restore you. Mercy to strengthen you. Mercy to heal you of the hurt you've caused others and others have caused you. Mercy that allows you to have a relationship with God. Mercy that allows you to experience peace and joy whilst living in a broken world. Let us take this coming year one day at a time, knowing that each day there is new mercy, there is new compassion, there is new love for us to receive from a God who is faithful. Great is your faithfulness. That's what the author says. Great is your faithfulness, God. Or perhaps a more literal way of putting it is this, abundant is your faithfulness. God is abounding in faithfulness. And the word that he uses for faithful can be translated as literal, literal, literally firmness, moral fidelity, stability, steady, true. That is the kind of faithfulness that God has. And this is written during a period of Israel's history where they have clearly been unfaithful towards God. And yet, he still remained faithful to them. The same is true of us. We have been unfaithful to him and yet he still remains faithful to us. And that is really the story of the Bible. A faithful God, an unfaithful people, and a God continuing to pursue in faithfulness us, though we were unfaithful. And that gives us hope going into 2019, because if he is faithful, if he is firm and if he is stable, it means that he won't leave us. We can be confident that no matter what lies ahead, whatever we may face, he is abundant in faithfulness. He isn't going anywhere. He will not forsake us, but will be right alongside us in it. Not only as individuals, but also as a church, as a body. He is faithful says this in Hebrews, let your conduct be without covetousness. 
Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Fearful of what lies ahead for you next year? God says, don't be. Why? Because he has promised to never leave you, nor forsake you. And this is the hope that we have as Christians. The confidence we have that God is my helper, that he is present, that he has not abandoned me, and therefore I will not fear. Therefore I will hope in him. The next verse of Lamentation says this, The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I hope in him. The term portion is often used in regard to the physical promised land and how it was divided up between the different tribes of Israel, their portion, their allotted land, or some translations will say their inheritance. And it was only the priests, the Levites, who didn't have a physical portion because God was their portion. And Jerusalem lies in ruins but the author has hope because it is God who is his inheritance. It is God who is his portion. And if you've accepted Jesus, the world around you can be falling apart, but you can still have hope because you have him. You possess the greatest thing in the whole universe if you've accepted Jesus, and that is God himself both now and for all eternity he is your inheritance he is your portion he is your treasure a treasure that cannot be stolen away therefore hope in him put your trust in him and as we place our hope and trust in him there are two things that God calls us to do, and that is to wait and to seek. Next verse says this, The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. We live in a very instant world. You want to listen to mu new music? You just download it in seconds. Want to contact someone? You don't need to wait. You've got instant messages, you've got WhatsApp, you've got emails, you've got video calls. Order something from Amazon and you can sometimes even have it arrive the very same day. Don't have enough money to buy something? Just get a credit card. Our culture hates the idea of waiting. Waiting. I don't want to wait. I want it. I want it now. And we have so many things and such technology which allows us to have so many things now, now, now. Working in retail when you have to order stuff in and you tell them it's going to take months and months to come in, they're often not very happy because they don't want to wait. They want it now. You see, our culture doesn't have a very high view of waiting. But God, God does. God has a different view of waiting. Because the reality is that God does not work to our time schedule. He works to his. As a result, there will be many times when he calls us to wait. You can't get around it as Christians. There are going to be moments where we have to wait. And no matter how much we may want certain things to happen right here, right now, there are going to be moments where God says, no, no. Not right here, not right now. And when this happens, I want you to trust that God has a purpose in your waiting. And he's orchestrated such things for our good because he loves us, even if we can't see it right then. The Bible is uh, full of examples of God's people being called to wait. If you remember, for example, when we recently started looking at the book of Acts, we saw this, right? 
Jesus has risen again. He's conquered the grave. He's appeared to the disciples showing that he's alive. He's given them this great mission, the great commission of going out into all the world and proclaiming the gospel. And you can imagine the disciples, right? They must have been buzzing, eager to go. They're like, okay, we got your mission, Jesus. You're alive, you're risen, and now we need to go out and tell the world. But what does Jesus say to them before ascending? He says, wait. He tells them to wait. Acts 1, verse 4, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. He says to his disciples, I want you to wait. There's no indication that he gives a time frame of how long they have to wait. He just says, wait until you receive the promise of the Father. Wait. And as we read, they waited. And they received that promise. He told them to wait. And so often when God says, tells us to wait, we can easily be like, really? But we're ready to go. I'm ready to, I'm ready to do this. Or I'm ready to receive this. Lord, I'm, I'm ready. And God's reply is, not yet. Wait. You may think so. You may think it is the right time. But I know better. Waiting ultimately exposes where our trust really lies. Will you trust God, his timing, his purposes and plan, or will you trust in your own ability, your own wisdom, and seek to take matters into your own hands? The Bible has many examples of people who try to take the latter option and it just makes things worse. We need to change our view and how we see waiting. No longer seeing it as something to avoid at all costs. No longer seeing it as something in which we complain and drag our heels <laughs> kicking and screaming throughout that time. But rather seek to embrace it with God. Knowing that it is something he has ordained for good. Here are just a few, here are just some of the ways in which waiting can actually bless us. As I say, God has a purpose in our waiting and so often we're either so consumed with complaining that we have to wait or trying to make things happen quicker or just kind of just neglecting what the opportunities that waiting does for us that we miss out on what God's trying to do. You see, waiting can bless us in a number of ways. Here are some of them. Waiting can save us from entering into a situation we are not yet equipped to handle. Sometimes you really just aren't ready, and it is God's mercy that keeps you from that circumstance, keeps you from entering that situation, because you're just not ready. Waiting, it reveals what we've really put our trust in, Waiting exposes areas of our heart, it exposes what we're really trusting. And that can be an opportunity for God to highlight areas that need to change and then address them. Waiting develops character. And in lo along the same lines of that, waiting often develops patience, which is a fruit of the Spirit, right? One of the results of the Holy Spirit living inside of you as a Christian is that patience should increase. We should, we should find ourselves becoming more patient. And then there's also this, waiting is an opportunity to lean in closer to God. Waiting is an opportunity to lean in closer to God because waiting is uncomfortable. Waiting puts us in an environment where we feel weaker. We feel uncomfortable. And in those moments of weakness, it is an opportunity to lean on God. 
not to turn away from him, but rather to turn and come closer to him and say, Lord, I'm really desiring this. Oh, Lord, I'm seeking this, but things aren't just taking place, but I, I want to trust you. Or maybe it's just, well, actually, Lord, I'm going to take this time and invest it in knowing you more. Because ultimately, that's what God wants. As you wait for God, waiting for him to act in a certain situation or to change this or to respond in this way, as you are waiting for God, choose to wait with him. As you wait for God, choose to wait with him. Because he isn't calling you to wait alone. He is with you, even in your waiting. So as you place your hope in God, wait on him and in him and for him. And not only that, but then seek him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. This is verse 25, what we read. To the soul who seeks him. What will you seek after? What will you make your utmost pursuit this coming year? My challenge to you, my challenge to myself is this. Make it God. Make God your highest pursuit above all things, all other things. For there is no greater pursuit than to know God, to walk with God, to talk with him. And imagine if that was your resolution this year. That time of year where everybody begins to be, what's your New Year's resolution? What's your New Year's resolution? I'm not going to say there's anything necessarily wrong in New Year's resolutions, but we do tend to fail them quite quickly, don't we? <laughs> but what if you determined this year as we start, in some ways, I start a new season, a new year, to say, God, by your strength, by the empowerment of your Holy Spirit, I want to pursue you above all things. I want to seek after you above all things. Imagine if we sought to dedicate time and energy into our relationship with God making him our highest priority, remembering the good news that because God sought us, we can seek him. Because God sought after us, we are now able to seek and find him. Charles Spurgeon, the, the great British preacher, recalls the moment that this truth sunk in. He says this, The thought struck me. How did you come to be a Christian I sought the Lord but how did you seek the Lord and the truth flashed across my mind in a moment I should not have sought him unless there had been some previous influence in my mind to make me seek him I prayed thought I but then I asked myself how came I to pray I was induced to pray by reading the scriptures. Well, then how, how came I to read the scriptures? I did read them, but what led me to do so? Then in a moment I saw that God was at the bottom of it all and that he was the author of my faith. And so the whole doctrine of grace opened up to me and from that doctrine I have not departed to this day. And I desire to make this my constant confession. I ascribe my change wholly to God. This is the good news. That God sought us when we didn't want anything to do with him. We didn't, we, we, we didn't want anything to do with God. Imagine to take time and think back just as Spurgeon did. Be like, how did I come to know this Jesus? And begin to trace back the different steps of grace in your life. How you put a friend in your life who shared the gospel with you. They, they did. Or maybe how you stumbled across this message or you have a family member who brought you to church and shared the gospel with you. Isn't it amazing that when we trace it all back down, it all starts with God seeking us. It all starts with God reaching out to us. And because he 
sought us. We can know him. He sought us when we didn't want anything to do with him. And he did this through Jesus. Jesus becoming one of us so that now when we put our faith in him, we can find him. When we put our faith in him, we can know him. Have you accepted that gift? If not, you need to know that he's seeking you, he's pursuing you, even right now. And that brings us to our final verse for today in closing. Verse 26 says this, It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. The reason I want you to go into this new year with hope is because it is good and it is right to do so. For the Christian, we have every reason to be hopeful because the one whom we are called to put our hope in is faithful. And the cross is proof of that. You remember at the point that Lamentations is written, at the point in history in which it covers the author, which is most likely Jeremiah and Israel, they are not just waiting for physical salvation from their oppressors, their captors, their conquerors. They're waiting for an even greater salvation, a salvation from their sin. A salvation from themselves, from the, their own evil hearts. And perhaps we have even more reason to hope than, perhaps we have even more reason to hope than they do because that salvation has already come. At the cross, Jesus dying in my place, I have been saved from my sin. I have been saved from myself. I have been saved from my evil and wicked heart. If he is faithful then, if he is faithful to do so much for me on the cross, will he not be faithful now? So my prayer for you and my prayer for me is this, that we would enter this year with hope. That we would wait upon him in hope. That we would seek him this year knowing that God is faithful. Let's pray together. God, we want to echo the words of this author who would cry out, great is your faithfulness. That in the middle of his lamenting, him weeping and bearing his soul as so much death and destruction is around him, which is ultimately due to sin, to a nation corporately and individually turning their back on God in the midst of that brokenness he can proclaim great is your faithfulness God you are faithful and we want to thank you for the opportunity that we have to be reminded of that and there are going to be many different people here who have different Different feelings about the upcoming year. Maybe there's some of us who are excited. Got some things planned already maybe to look forward to. Maybe there's some of us who who are kind of dreading it or fearful of it. In whatever place we find ourselves, Lord, my prayer is that you would give us hope. That we would leave here today and enter into this new year full of hope because we know that you are faithful that there would be a marked difference in us. Even from the, the rest of the world looking in, they'd be able to see that and be able to see, wow, 
These people are so hopeful. Why are they so hopeful? And then maybe an opportunity for us to then tell them, I'm, help, I'm hopeful because of Jesus. I'm hopeful because he is faithful. And he is with me. So Lord, that is my prayer for us today. Help us to trust you as we wait in different situations when they arise and help us to trust you and to seek you. Give us a desire to know you more and to invest time in spending time with you and developing that relationship with you. So I do pray, Lord, that as we go away today, may we go away with just such confidence in your faithfulness and as a result, have such peace, such joy, such hope going into this new year, Jesus, and all that you have planned and in store for us. We ask this in your name, and we pray, we pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would do all of these things in our hearts and in our lives, Jesus. Amen.